drafting a best ball mania team on underdog fantasy from the 102. That's what we're going to do on today's episode of Stealing Bananas. I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find my newsletter, bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all of his great work over at Road of His. And we're hopping in a little bit of a different time for us recording-wise. I was on a little bit of a vacation, kind of behind on our, our recording schedule as a result. We're hopping in an afternoon best ball draft uh but yeah sean how you doing good and we're gonna put you under a lot of pressure today ben fresh off of a you know 2024 summer heat stroke trip to the lake (laughs) see what you have coming back off of vacation I always love when, you know, I tell you a little bit about my vacation and then you like describe it like eloquently back. Like, yeah, I mean, that's basically what it was. We were already on the clock because we had the 102. It filled. McCaffrey goes 101. I am I told you after I got through projections, I'm very comfortable with CeeDee Lamb at, at his cost. I know you really like him. Seems like the right play out of the 102 to just get your Lamb exposure. You can get your Tyreek Hill exposure other, elsewhere. Um or your Jamar Chase, or or what have you. So we're off and running with the CD Lamb team. I don't think we've picked from the very beginning yet. Have we? It's a lot of fun to have this pick up front. I did a show with Blair live earlier today. So hopefully anybody who is looking for what to do out of the 112, you can check that out if you haven't already. I will say I strongly prefer this pick at the beginning i love having lamb i was checking my exposures i am well above baseline on him which uh but i have to tell you it's pretty exciting when you're talking about the guy who is the 102 and probably should be the clear cut 101 you said you loved what you got from him in your projections do you expect him to you know end up gapping the field if he works out the contract stays healthy I mean, anything else we should even be remotely concerned about there well yeah i mean one of the biggest things that come came came to light in in digging into the dallas projections is not exactly a surprise for anyone who's been paying attention but there's no one else there um and it's hard i mean i i dug in and really tried to figure something out I wound up feeling very strongly like the Dallas Cowboys roster sets up very similarly to the 2023 Rams, which, you know, in terms of this concept of who could be this year's Puka Nakua, which we always say there's not going to be a this year's Puka Nakua whenever that kind of thing comes up. But it is a situation where you have the one star that's expected to absolutely dominate. Last year for the Rams, it was Cooper Cup. Obviously, he gets banged up with that hamstring injury, re-injures it, misses the start of the season. That really opens the door. And there was really no one else. They were really pushing the Van Jefferson stuff. Obviously, Tyler Higby is a route-type play out of the tight end position, but not somebody who earns a lot of volume on his own merits necessarily. Um, Jake Ferguson is a similar type of player. Ran a lot of routes last year. I think is going to be productive, but I don't think he's somebody that goes and gets a lot of targets and and fills a huge target void. Brandon Cooks last year, his targets per out run really, really cratered. And this stuff doesn't really matter for Lamb, but it's interesting. I mean, in 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 the perspective of the, when I project, I typically say the best players get theirs and then you look at everything else below them. The alphas are gonna alpha kind of a thing. But Cooks last year only got a target on 15.5% of his uh, of his routes. In 2022, he was still over 20%. He had been multiple years prior to that. So dropping all the way down to 15.5% is a meaningful drop-off for him at his age. Jalen Tolbert hasn't done anything to justify any real hype so far in his career. Jalen Brooks, people have brought up, hasn't really done anything. And you look back at his prospect profile, isn't that amazing? They have that Kevontae Turpin return specialist, who I honestly think could be like vaguely fun if they start to do anything creative with him because they do need to get touches to people in this offense. They obviously don't have a lot of uh, explosive uh, weaponry in the running back game either. And then they have a six-round rookie, Ryan Flournoy, who played at a small college, is more of an athletic prospect than the Puka Nakua mold, where it's like, okay, Puka Nakua, you looked back on it, had great target earning and great efficiency in college, low routes numbers. But when he was out on the field, he dominated in a way that 
you know, a lot of times we see the small school guys, they have massive stat lines. Flournoy's stat lines are like 800, 900 yards. Maybe that's quarterback play. I don't know. But to me, he doesn't strike me as he's going to step in as a rookie and dominate volume either. Because why didn't he have 1,500 yard seasons when he was playing at, I believe it's Southwest Missouri State or Southeast Missouri State? Um, so anyway, there's just not really anything else here. There's no running back. There's no real target earning tight ends. Uh, City Lamb could just get 200 targets. And I'm not really sure what else they could do in Dallas around that. But as I talked through all that, Sean, we, we, we did get all the way back around on the clock. Um, we're, I mean, you have some receivers at the, at the top of the queue that I'm very into Devonta Smith and like neighbors, Cooper cup digs. Um, I, I guess I, I haven't done a fast draft in a while for, Where we're at, we're going to go ahead and take Smith. But for where we're at, like, I, I guess I didn't realize Smith was a second rounder at this point. I knew he had risen in the third. But he was more or less the top. Mike Evans was still on the board, the only receiver ahead of him. Devon Achan was also still on the board. He goes to the turn with Michael Pittman. Neighbors is kind of the pick for me there, even before Devonta Smith. And he came back through. It looks like he's the top guy for you as well so we'll start with the three receivers i really like that start from the the early draft selections to go with three early receivers and then you it opens up the four or five turn to, to go a lot of directions yeah and one of the things there with Devonte smith i think part of him being locked so tightly in that area is because of the week 17 matchup with cd lambs so you have a lot of lamb managers who aren't going to let him slide I like that fit. You have Smith with the week five by. You have CeeDee Lamb with the week seven by. Both of those elements free you up to potentially later uh, just have more flexibility with all the teams that are on week 12 and week 14 buys. The Cowboys, one of only two teams there in week seven. I think that is a little bit of an extra advantage for them one that the san francisco 49ers also have for week nine with the 49ers their other team is the pittsburgh steelers which ben we're probably not playing very heavily i like the way you describe the situation for lamb if we have a receiver who you know has a season like you know we got from cooper cup a couple of years ago and you know obviously lamb is already coming off of a season that's in that vicinity I, mean, I would expect it to be him there are you know, structural reasons that you know you just basically went through where when you have an up-tempo successful passing offense that has a superstar and doesn't have anything else that's where you could start to challenge the real limits of receiver targets and push for that 2000 yard season i think that's very realistic for lamb to hit at some point and this is probably his best chance run me through why you like malik neighbors ahead of names like cooper cup and stefan diggs who are you know, superstars in their own right and especially with the rams putting out all of the positive notes on cup and we've dug into Diggs in a little bit more detail but Malik Neighbors, a rookie, a lot of concerns about the quarterback play there. I've made the case that he's better than Marvin Harrison. It sounds like you're at least willing to entertain the possibility that he has a huge season. Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly would be part of it, that you think he's better than Marvin Harrison, that you've been so high on him. Now, a big part of it for me is wanting exposure to his particular profile, how dominant he was at earning volume. I've talked about the Brian Thomas stuff. And Brian Thomas didn't earn a lot of volume, but I've been more or less forced to consider that I could be wrong on, on, on Brian Thomas as well. But if there's even a, a scenario where Brian Thomas is a good player and a worthwhile first round pick, which the Jaguars thought he was, then what neighbors did is even more impressive in terms of how dominant he was in targets per route, weighted targets per route, the efficiency stuff, et cetera. He was, uh, you know, incredible in college. And it, it, for me, a big part of it is just exposure. Like Cup, I guess, is trickling up now in the third round. But you can get him in the late third a reasonable amount. And Diggs is just like free falling. Like nobody wants to draft him. 
So those are two guys that I can actually get exposure to in the later third at times when I'm comfortable with it. Neighbors is a little bit harder to get in the later third. So the real answer is like just wanting to make sure I have exposure to neighbors more so than probably straight up ranking him higher than those two veterans. Although there are reasons to consider ranking him higher, the back weighted production, the, you know, the types of hit, what do you get when you're right type of things that, that can occur with the wide band rookie bets, right? They're, they can be lower floor, but they can be higher ceiling. They can hit in ways that we can't really fathom when we think about it. Like I could say things that all are possible with him in July and, and Daniel Jones and Brian Dable and how this is all going to work so positively. And whether that actually comes to pass in this season is like not even the point. Like it just sounds ridiculous to make big, bold proclamations. But if you tried to make a big, bold proclamation for the other recent rookie hits, Puka, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, go back to OBJ, right? Who, who did it with the giants and, and came from LSU. And people are obviously comparing to, you know, neighbors to any of those guys. You talk about how good they were. It's not going to sound plausible. Even uh, we are back up on the clock. You have McBride at the top of the queue. It, Travis Kelsey and Mark Andrews go ahead of McBride in this one. I love the opportunity to get Trey McBride at the late fourth round. I take him pretty consistently in the, at the three, four turn. If, if, if it makes sense with some of those Puka teams or Cooper cup teams, you get a little correlation. We get them all the way at four eleven in this one. So that's nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, a lot of stuff in neighbors profile that is that is to like in terms of why to get exposure to him it's it's almost like not describable right <laughs> i mean it's it's like i could just make up a lot of stuff but people it, it's the uncertainty of rookie production that really matters did you want to go two tight ends here now that we're back on the clock or do you like uh keenan more i'm okay with that but i do think there is some value to making sure we don't fall behind a receiver this has been yeah, an extremely receiver heavy draft yeah i want to get um Keenan, I think that's probably – I've started to ease off the two uh, elite tight ends, especially if it requires two at this point. We grabbed Keenan Allen at 502. It has been a heavy running uh, receiver draft. Had a conversation on Twitter about Isaiah Pacheco or a short little – I sent a tweet about Isaiah Pacheco. He went at the turn in between our McBride and Keenan Allen picks. People have were mentioning to me in, in my tweet in reply that Three receiver starts with like a tight end and Pacheco can be really nice ones. I'm open to that idea, but I don't think I'm – the case I was making is even if Pacheco is a, is a small win at his cost, that, you know, looking back on it at the end of the year, the 2024 landscape might just create a scenario where there's enough later running back points and, the, and his particular style of upside is, is more replaceable and the wide receivers and tight ends were, were what you needed in this range. Um, Cause I do see the scenario or, or at least the argument for Pacheco being like a strictly reasonable value at cost. Is he somebody you would have considered there at all? If you didn't go with the turn? No, I don't think so. I don't think that you can play running backs really in this range, unless you think that they have star talent. The dynamic this season really requires you to load up the receiver position i mean ideally you'd really get six in the first seven rounds and that can be difficult because other drafters are also taking the guys that you want and so you'll hit these pockets where you really feel like other players work better or you have them higher and yet when the receiver tap shuts off it shuts shuts off so completely that it breaks your build it takes away your access to those high scoring weeks that are so important. I think that when we look at the tight end position, if you look at it historically, you look at the big scorers and they are going to gap the rest of the guys. And that means that for full season production, you have a huge advantage for the spike week upside in terms of consistency of it, but also for the absolutely huge games they give you this you know very clear advantage there's also the case that there's a limited number of total tight ends that you're going to have on your roster and you're not going to be able to cover it just with 
volume. Now, there is an argument to be made for taking actually as many as four tight ends and sprinkling them in across the back, creating more pathways, more access to the weekly touchdowns, that type of dynamic. And that helps you potentially in the playoffs as well. It's going to help you more in seasons where guys like a Laporta and a Trey McBride are available late. If you subscribe to the thesis that probably those guys are few and far between this year and that the top guys are going to score well, then you really need to create that access or that exposure because as we move through and we get into rounds nine through 15, the running back firepower is so strong. Now, does Pacheco probably project to beat those players and most of those players? Probably. But once you look at them as a group, I don't think that Pacheco does much for you. Again, I mean, if the Kansas City Chiefs go scorched earth, which I think is possible, if he gets almost all the touches, which is possible, then yes. I mean, there there is a scenario where he is a viable player and even someone who you know pulls you through. I think that's kind of a narrow path that you're drawing for. It's also a structure that you have to be very right for it to work. Yeah, I like the way that you put that. Um and I also, I think the key point or one of the key points is, you know, not wanting to fall behind at receiver this year is a really big element of it. It, You know, last year at this time, we were talking about taking running backs in this four or five range, and that ended up being a really, you know, viable path. It was something that was very successful for us on a lot of our stuff. It doesn't, it's hard to say like, yeah, that that was successful last year because I had some people reply like running backs at the round four or five turn were a good pick last year. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. But I thought that last year too in advance. It's not hindsight when I say I thought that last year and it worked. And now I'm saying I don't think that this year. And I'm not saying that I'll be right again, but like that's that's what I want to respond to. You know, it's like it's not that's something that it looked that way going in. Um, we're back up here, Sean. Deontay Johnson goes right ahead of us. You have Jackson Smith and Jigba top of the queue. I'm very game for that. She Rice already off the board, I assume. I had missed that pick, but that's the trio of guys that is always fun to grab. Brian Thomas goes here at the turn. We get back up. I'd be really into Lad McConkey here as well, or just taking the CJ Stroud value, but we don't have any stack options. We could take Kyler ahead of ADP, but McConkey, Sean, is kind of similar to that Puka profile the more I think about it. He didn't run a lot of routes. We've talked about that. We don't have a lot to go off. But the more I look at him, and when I did the Chargers pro, uh, projection, I mean, he did have a solid targets per out run each of his three years and a good, if not very good, yards per target each of the three years for good yards per out run on small routes totals. It's like, yeah, it's tough to project that forward, but it's better than having bad numbers, right? Um, as far as the volume earning goes. And he did have a higher dot each of the last two years. So the like weighted targets per route run stuff I look at, strong seasons per route, but just not a lot of routes. It does increase the risk that like this is a little bit fluky or whatever, but coming out of an offense that had Brock Bowers and had some other good receivers that had to transfer away, McConkey was consistently good per route. Again, I, I've I've now referenced Puka Nakua's very unique rookie season multiple ways in the show, and I don't want to ever really use that as a benchmark, but in terms of what it was about that, at least when I looked back on it, that I thought was something I missed, it was that even though he didn't have enough playing time in college, when he was out there, he was producing per route and showing an ability that once the routes then consolidated for him at the NFL level, and he ran way more routes than he had at any in any season in college, all of it really was there for him to go win per route on a bigger sample. Now, not everyone's going to be able to project it forward onto a big sample. And in fact, most can't, but lad McConkey at least has the element where it's like, yeah, it looks like he can earn on a per route basis against good competition, maybe better competition in Georgia on his average route than he'll have for the chargers. I know that seems blasphemous, but if you really think through it, Brock Bowers, in addition to, you know, A.D. Mitchell was over there and Jermaine Burton was there early in his career and um, all the other, you know, great players that Georgia has produced versus, you know, you're routes against Joshua Palmer and, and Quentin Johnston and guys that have not actually performed particularly well. 
the NFL level or at least not at a really high level, if somebody is like a stud in that passing game, it wouldn't surprise me if McConkie's able to, to – assuming he's able to stay healthy and run big routes to be the guy who really consolidates stuff. No, I don't think it's really provocative at all to claim that he had better target competition at Georgia. We'll see what Quentin Johnson is able to do. For me, Ben, the move in the direction of McConkie has a lot to do with who else is there. In this particular draft, Kenneth Walker is gone. Kyle Pitts is gone. But most importantly, the trio of players that I think should definitely be going ahead of him. That doesn't mean they're going to outscore him. But in terms of everything we know about profiles and upside and where you want to invest to maximize all of those types of things to get that asymmetrical play that we've talked about at Rotoviz since the beginning. One of the things that fantasy douche really emphasized to the fantasy community, Jordan Addison, Deontay Johnson, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, all of those guys should be ahead of him. But then once those guys are gone, which they were here, once you get him a few spots below ADP and there's no one else who is a must have, then I think he makes sense on your roster. So that's kind of where yeah. I put him. We are coming back around and this would set up as a running back type of selection. Maybe there's a different pick that I yeah, would the certainly pick you prefer always want to make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're referring to Brock Bowers, which is, uh, I think where we're going to wind up going if he doesn't go here. He makes a lot of sense, and then we take the running back on the way back. We will be here at, at 8, 11, pick 95 would give us a solid number two tight end to go along with McBride. It can be, you know, close the book on tight end, feel really good about a McBride. Oh, we want one pick ahead of us. Spoke too soon. There's a snipe in real time. I don't think those QBs are the right move, Sean. So probably... DeAndre Swift, because we already have Keenan Allen and JSN. We kind of built out that game a little bit. I, I like Swift. What, what do you think? Yeah, we can definitely go over that route. I do think that Dak Prescott here, oh. when you have CeeDee Lamb and Devontae Smith, makes sense. I'm guessing he will come back through okay. to us. Do you want to lock that game in since we have those two guys in the first two rounds? Yeah, I wasn't thinking through that. I definitely... Uh, I think he makes sense at this turn. It's hard to take him like over Jaden Daniels straight up. Who's got a, you know, an ADP just a few spots behind him. And you also had in the queue there, but I mean, I, with that, it could be just pure pass volume. That could be pretty massive for him. My projection for him was very positive and favorable. And you look at some of the team level stuff, as well. I mean, one of the fascinating things when we were talking about the lamb pick and I was talking about, there's not a lot of other target earners and stuff is thinking through that last year they played very fast. They were willing to be pass heavy. Mike McCarthy had them like they were trying to, to really set regular season records. I know at one point I was talking about where it seemed like McCarthy was trying to get Dak the MVP. And there was certainly an element of, you know, Kellen Moore got all this hype and then he left and McCarthy wanted to you know kind of push Kellen Moore out so that he could have more of a say in the offense as the head coach and everybody was like well that was a mistake Kellen Moore is going to go succeed with the Chargers he didn't particularly succeed he has now moved on to the Eagles and McCarthy I think was really reveling in that element of it like hey we're you know we're doing good things here offensively without Kellen Moore and even if you look at their their playoff loss it wasn't because of their their offense their offense scored scored in that game, kept, tried to keep up. They, they ended up throwing like 60 passes and for like 400 yards, they really uh, went after it and chased that game after the Packers scored early. But yeah, I mean, if you see, if, if this team plays fast again, and it's been high, like when, when Moore was there too, it's been, it's been um, like top eight in total play volume for the Cowboys. That's been several years in a row. I didn't write down the exact number, but um made a little note that, you know, it had been several years in a row. The pass rate has been high. The running backs, they didn't invest in them. So the pass rate is probably going to stay high, right? Like it's not going to be Ezekiel Elliott and Rico Dowdle ground and pound on this offense. And, and so you could see Dak really putting up the type of passing numbers. Like I, Dak sometimes gets thought of as more of a rusher than he is. He really needs to throw for a lot, but you could see him putting up like flirting with with 5000 passing yards you know and and that's where you get back to like could anyone else in this passing game be good and if not then 
your point about CeeDee Lamb maybe being a 2,000 receiving, you know, a 2,000 yard receiver, like that starts to become more plausible as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that even without much rushing, I don't want to push the pocket passing stacks too much is, is kind of where, you know, what I'm trying to defend against as I talk through this, but I like, um, I like being able to tell myself the, the story that I could just tell myself there with Dak in terms of him being a really big hit at 902, even without much rushing value. Yeah. And I mean, you explained how and, and why it would happen. <laughs> Their running backs are, I mean, it's perhaps the weakest running back depth chart we've seen any team have at this point in the season in, you know, 20, 25 years. <laughs> so they have, it's set weird it up that, that they don't even have crazy. like, I mean, cause like you make that claim and you're like, yeah, there's been some other weak ones, but the, a lot of those other weak ones at least had like a young, fresh leg, like UDFA or something, you know? I mean, they don't even really have anyone that, that feels like they can compete. It's tricky. There. I mean, this is a team where Royce Freeman could easily lead in rushing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you start doing the projection for them, and you're like, Royce Freeman's probably going to be a key part of this team. We are back up. We have just DeAndre Swift. Um, you've got Chase Brown's top of the queue. I really like getting him. There's a lot of ways we could play this. Yeah, it's a question of if you want Corum as well and you're willing willing to risk Brown. I have a pretty big gap between them in my rankings. Yeah, let's do Brown. Because I think he's going to be the, I don't know, clear starter. He's going to be a very relevant player on a team that could create a massive amount of running back production i don't think that you can go for a handcuff ahead of him now quorum does come back the other one i would mention here one of the things that we did was we could actually stop at six receivers if we wanted with this it's one of the things that jake bose's uh, simulation also says but i think jerry judy is a great value here if we wanted to go with one more sure we can take judy if you want to throw him on we will have to we're going to be well, I guess our tight end too. Like we're gonna have to find another stack. You have Herbert in the queue. Hopefully, he comes back around. I guess we could do Gino, or we could do Daniel Jones with Molly Neighbors. So we do have a couple options there. There's a quarterback on Judy's team too, but you, you <laughs> don't <is>. ask him. <laughs> there is. Yeah, once you've pushed for, I'm gonna keep making this your Molly Neighbors pick. Then I think you've got to be open <laughs> to Daniel Jones. Those guys sure. will sink or swim together. But you know, once we have the Chicago pieces there with DeAndre Swift and Keenan Allen, and we get JSN onto this roster, I think that especially once you have spent on a Dak Prescott, which is you know kind of early. QB window-ish type of pick. I think you could take Gino and sit with two quarterbacks. One of the things that works for me with this roster is that it's going to be, there are scenarios in which it could end up being a three QB team with a ton of upside and still a very reasonable amount of total investment at that position. I like that. That, that makes a lot of sense to me as well. You mentioned Corum and and weren't really seemingly interested in Trey Benson there, whose ADP is a, a, quite a bit higher and had fallen through a little bit. I tend to to agree with you that Benson's a little bit overpriced, but talk through a little bit like why you would be Corum over Benson. Well, I think the two offenses are going to separate. I think that the Cardinals will be a lot better. I don't know. I mean, Benson is an interesting guy in that one of the things that Pete and I discussed a little bit this week on the best ball banana stand was this dynamic between Josh Jacobs and Marshawn Lloyd versus James Connor and Trey Benson. And, you know, kind of getting in the direction of the case where those two teams ADPs should probably be flipped that the Packers are going to be a committee that Lloyd could score really well out of. Whereas 
I mean, the Cardinals coming off of this fantastic season for James Conner are sending out signals that he is going to be the guy. If that's the case, and especially knowing that Benson's profile is a little bit more hope than production. Now, the things that people are hopeful about are exciting. But with that being the case, I do think that we might want to wait for his price to slide even a little bit more as yeah. the you know early training camp news comes along he should be going quite a bit later i guess as you make that comparison to the packers that makes quite a bit of sense to me i don't know if i would be on board with connor going as high as jacobs is or or perhaps just having both of them a little cheaper although the cardinals cardinals are a team that when i did their projection i felt very optimistic about what they what they're building and i've heard really good things about what their defenses uh has done i, I saw another earlier offseason video of cj stroud with with uh, nate tice on the athletic pod that i had missed the first time it came around where stroud's breaking down a couple of the plays from his rookie season and they're playing the cardinals and he just makes a point to say that this is a really good defense the cardinal people are sleeping on the cardinals they're going to be a good defense going forward um we are back up sean can you click over to the other video oh, there we go um I mean, Herbert sliding through to 143, the clear ADP value here. Does the guy in the turn have any chargers? What are you thinking here? Um, the answer would be no, he does not. I guess I would go ahead and make that pick and then see where we want to go. Okay, that's fine. So we grab Herbert as our QB2. We we're talking through this as a potential three QB build. Daniel Jones still going to be very in play later. We don't have to do it as a Q, three QB build. We're back up quickly. As a guy on the turn drafted really quick. You have Vidal there. He does add to the stack. But Jalen Wright is also still there. Do you like Vidal over Jalen Wright here? I'm, I'm willing to go either way. I also think that Komet is an interesting play. Oh, we sure. want to lean into that part of it. Let's do it. Let's let's push running back because we don't really. I, I I like Komet enough that he can be our. We can just close out tight end with two if you're if you're comfortable with that as well. We already have the Keenan Allen play, JSN. We've built out a little bit of a Bears and a Week 17 thing there. Komet's one of the last tight end twos where you feel comfortable. Musgrave comes off a few picks later. I would put him in that in that category as well, but where you feel comfortable kind of just stopping it too. For me personally, I know there's a lot of people that are are doing a lot of Johnny Smith and some of that stuff later, Sean. We we I mean, no offense, another one that I'm kind of okay with, but I think at a certain point those those tight ends are trickier. You probably would want two more, I think, because you're probably looking at a high percentage chance of not getting the type of late round tight end production that you're expecting. With my thought there. Um, what were we talking about just before the Herbert pick? We were looking at some of the running back scenarios, and it was interesting that Corum almost came all the way back to us. It was a pretty large fall for him. And then right ahead of our selection, Zach Charbonnet, Ty Chandler, and Kendra Miller all went. The oh, I was making a note that when I – Sorry to, to cut you off, but that because we were talking about the backs and we're talking about Benson. When I did the because the, the Cardinals market projection for their total points scored is pretty low. It's among the you know the, the lower teams in the league. But I was talking about how CJ Stroud has talked up their defense. I think their offense is well put together talent wise. You have Kyler now for the first time, probably getting a full season with a non Cliff Kingsbury offense because he you know you got to play with. Obviously, towards ACL in Kingsbury's final year, he played the end of last year, but this is a year where he's working through the whole offseason in a different – and we know you know, down the, the stretch of Kyler's and Kingsbury's time together that Kyler was like yelling at him from the field, right? Like we know that there wasn't a great partnership there. Maybe Kingsbury was holding him back. Maybe Kyler still has some upside in, in him to be a – what we thought for a while, maybe he just was like a legitimately high end quarterback. I, I don't know. What do you, do you think the Cardinals could be a surprise team this year? I'm, I'm like, I look at their roster and as you were talking through the Connor stuff, um, really high on McBride, obviously I think Harrison definitely adds something immediately. I know you're maybe not like certain that he's going to be a superstar, 
but Connor having a really good year last year, Michael Wilson, actually a pretty efficient year last year. I'm not drafting a lot of him, but serves a role. I think for this team, Greg Dortch serves a role for this team. And then if the defense is well-designed and, and you have quarterbacks that are um, praising the way that they're structured defensively, this seems like a team that could be interesting this season. Yeah, I don't think the Cardinals should be one of the lowest projected teams in terms of total points in any way, shape, or form. Not when you have Marvin Harrison and Trey McBride and a viable rushing QB. Not when you have an effective running game. You mentioned some of the things people have been talking about related to that defense. I've heard very positive things about their run game design. That team is going to score points. So I don't think that we should be too scared about uh, selecting players off of it. We are back up. And we have some interesting picks here. Vital has fallen a long way. This yeah. would be the next pick would be the Geno pick. We have, you know, Antonio Gibson as a potential play off of uh, Justin Herbert. But I'm assuming you're at Vital for this first. Yeah, one. Vital is the first pick. It's nice to see him fall through. Um, Gibson's an interesting bring back. I don't. Do you want to do Gino here or, or keep seeing if he slides? Because we're like right at ADP for him, and we could also go to. I almost want to take it on the running back here because we could also go to Daniel Jones. Well, another big ADP value is Jaleel McLaughlin. And I know that he's not your preferred player. Yeah, we can take him here. 17 picks behind ADP. Um, hard to pass up. Yeah, Bucky I think Irving's his... the one that we had to let slide in that spot. I probably would have just taken Bucky. <laughs> so I do hope, yeah, I do hope that Geno Smith comes back through i think with how tightly we have that part of it put together you know versus where we were with herbert that that would be a lot of fun it would look to me at that point like a team that was set up to then make it through that three-week playoff gauntlet but then i just put out a, a piece that i would consider to be something of a concurring opinion with your work and thoughts on the Denver Broncos running game today. It was one of the longer, <laughs> one of the longest articles I've ever written for the site. And the main premise is that the Denver Broncos are going to lead the league in rushing expected points. I shouldn't say rushing in running back expected points. They are always among the top five. This is Sean Payton teams always among the top five in receiving expected points to the running backs. Then I don't know how it's going to work out, but I like the prices that we're getting on these players. The implied scoring totals by ADP, which you can find in Blair Andrews' win the flex tool, are are just dramatically below what the winners are going to do in this running game. They're also way below what you get when you pull up the range of outcomes tool. Now, part of it is that Aldrich Estime, who is going at the very end of drafts, could be a fly in the ointment. I think that Blake Watson is arguably the best fit for this offense. And yet right now I want to be overweight on both Javante Williams and Jaleel McLaughlin. When you get them, especially like the value we got in this particular draft, I think it's an automatic click. The most likely that one of the things that I think it's easy to forget is that Undrafted free agents have done well for Sean Payton, but it hasn't necessarily been the first year. That's one of the reasons why I think that McLaughlin actually might blow up in year two. It'd be similar to Pierre Thomas, but also players that he's drafted, even drafted in the first round, like Mark Ingram. Maybe the most extraordinary thing that I ever run across when I'm looking up the backstory of players is that Mark Ingram was a first round pick for them who was their RB3 for his first three years. And then he ends up going on to this very long, productive career. If you told me that Estime and Watson scored big points in 2026, but that one of, if not both, of Javante Williams and Lil McLaughlin massively outperformed ADP in this season, that's what I would tell you is the most likely thing. But basically, I think that all of these guys should be targets. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good way of putting it. When I did their projection, this is the other team, and I made notes on both of them. A little preview to some of you know my projection pod series with Leone and what I'll be talking about, but on both Arizona and Denver that I, I, it was hard for me to be at market on, on Denver as well on the TD numbers. Cause I, I, I am optimistic in the bone Nicks fit with the Sean Payton offense. 
But when I went through the the running back receiving stuff, and we're almost on the clock here, I'll, I'll give some thoughts on that in a moment. But let's make our picks here at pick 16 and 17. Or at the 16, 17 turn. Our build right now is a 2 4 7 2. We're talking about a third QB. Geno Smith does go a few picks before us. Do you want to take Daniel Jones? Or are you just because that's not as stacked up, you don't like that as much? I'm okay with going with Jones. I was certainly hoping that if we made a second pick, it would be Geno. But Daniel Jones gives you that, you know, rushing right hybrid upside. Let's go and ahead. I agree and... with your point that if we take neighbors, like that he's tied to Daniel Jones in a meaningful way. The other thing there, Ben, is that I don't actually love the other options here. I don't think there's anybody we're being pressed to take. No. Tyrone Tracy's intriguing. Now that we've actually taken Deion Jones there, you have Damian Pierce at the top of the queue. I, I, I've i considered him, but I don't know that I really buy it. You have Estime in the queue. He's a guy I've taken a lot of, but I haven't taken a lot of McLaughlin. I think you could take them together, but I like Tracy the most here. What do you think? Yeah, let's go ahead and go that route. I've, I wouldn't say soured on Tracy. I do think that probably his early season production is going to be fairly limited. I guess that maybe the late season production also looks to me a little bit thinner than I was originally hoping, but Ben, you and I were doing a little bit of SFB uh, discussion before the show, just chatting back and forth, talking about some guys who could benefit from the return numbers in that format. And Tracy's somebody who had, over 400 kick return yards last year. I mean, Tyrone Tracy is going to immediately be one of the more athletic players in the NFL. He gives a real jolt to a Giants offense that I think is a little bit underrated, but certainly outside of Malik Neighbors, you know, they're still looking for juice. Now, Jalen Hyatt is one of the fastest players in the NFL. It's one of the reasons why I think that people are sleeping a little bit on him. Darius Slayton, very athletic, but you know, struggles with some of the receiving elements of being a wide receiver, which is never great. Uh, Wondell Robinson undervalued. And yeah, I'm on record as saying Devin Singletary is one of the more underrated players and one of my favorite players. That's, I guess, a long-winded way of still saying that Tracy adds some electricity to that offense, which if they're going to be a lot more like 2022, then 2023 this season, um, they're going to need some players to make the types of plays that I think he's capable of. It's also uh, you know, intriguing that he has that receiving background. If you get a hybrid player in there as well, it opens up some more paths to touches. Definitely. So for our final pick here, we click on the running back tab really quick. I kind of like a sixth back. And actually, the name I would float, Sean, would be Trey Sermon, who seems to be the very clear number two for the Colts and actually was an effective runner in this scheme last year. I think would be benefited by uh, the Anthony Richardson mobility element in terms of his rushing efficiency. Were he to play a lot? I don't think he will play a lot if Jonathan Taylor is healthy but he would be a bring back to that giant stack that we've brought out or built out a little bit. You have Jatavian Sanders in there. What's the case for a tight end three in this build? Well, even when you have a decent investment in tight ends, the RCE continues to like taking three. It gives you more paths through the playoffs. We might have stronger, you know, talent options at tight end than at some other positions. You know, maybe Chiga Conquo would be the guy I just, I mean, I really never want to take Trey Sermon again, but I've had other <laughs> sharp folks also mention him to me. I, then I don't, want, <laughs> I don't want Jonathan Taylor to get hurt. I think yeah, we can take that... Javon Sanders here and, and go three tight ends if you think that's the route. The, the five running backs aren't particularly strong. Vidal's are three. What are you thinking? Let's go ahead oh. and go with Sermon. Let's go ahead we and go ran with the, Sermon. We ran the clock out and got Sermon. I got you. I, I filibustered you into to a Trey Sermon pick on your account. Now your exposure is no longer 0%. I'm going to have to look at that. 
the entire <laughs> rest of the draft season, Ben. So thank you for that one. Uh, Trey Sermon now will have a 2,000 yard campaign. Not 2,000. We'll say 1,000 with it back weighted. He'll be the guy with the three 20 point weeks in the fantasy playoffs. And then we can play this clip over and over when we win the $1.5 million. One of the things that I did like there is just getting a little bit more depth at running back. I guess I'm more excited about the running back group maybe than you are and a little bit more concerned about our tight ends. And yet, I mean, the overall structure for this team, I absolutely loved. Yeah, so in the end, it's a Dak Prescott, Justin Herbert, Daniel Jones team. Running back, we had DeAndre Swift, Chase Brown, Kamani Fidel, uh, Jaluma McLaughlin, Tyrone Tracy, Trey Sermon. Pretty thin, I think. I, I, they're all zero RB guys that I really like, but I, I felt like that was a little bit thinner for a five RB build. I like to get in a six, even though I don't think Sermon's necessarily going to be a huge producer. The seven receivers are CeeDee Lamb, stacked with Dak, of course. Uh, Devonta Smith, who's a bring back on that. Malik Neighbors, who is stacked with Daniel Jones. Uh, as is Tyrone Tracy, and we had Trey Sermon as a bring back on that. Keenan Allen, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Lad McConkey and Jerry Judy McConkey stacked with Justin Herbert. We don't have a a New England bring back on that, but we did take McLaughlin. I think is their Week 16 opponent, right? The Chargers and Broncos are Week 16. McBride and Cole Komet at tight end. So I mean. You mentioned the Geno thing. We do have three Bears on this team. DeAndre Swift, Keenan Allen, Cole Komet. We don't have Caleb Williams. We do have JSN. So we have this Week 17 matchup where we do – it's Chicago and, and Seattle where we do have a lot of investment there. Uh, you know, getting Geno Smith would have built that game out meaningfully. It didn't work out. We wound up taking Daniel Jones – with Malik Neighbors, adding Tyrone Tracy to make that a little bit of a QB running back receiver bet on the Giants, which is a full season bet. Didn't have to have something to bring that back in week 17, but I do like taking Trey Sermon at this point. I, I think if you look into what he's done so far in his career, he hasn't been amazing or anything, but he's been somewhat meaningful. Sean, another thing I would sell you on is that he went to Philly the year before last when Shane Steichen was still there and then Steichen brought him over to Indy with him last offseason. And behind Taylor and Zach Moss last year, it was Sermon who clearly had the third most running back touches. He had 35 carries, 160 rushing yards, nothing great, but 4.6 yards per carry. He was solid in the, in the efficiency metrics. If you go look at some of his, uh, again, very, very small sample. But if you go look at some of his like forced missed tackles and yards after contact, they were at least vaguely interesting. Um, the other guys that, um, or I guess the missed tackles forced weren't great, but the yards after contact were all right. The other guys that are on this team still backing up Taylor, you know, Zach Moss is gone. The other guys are are the same dudes that were there last year. Evan Hole, Tyler Goodson, some of those guys who didn't play a whole lot. And so, you know, when I went through my projections for this team, I, first of all, had seen a lot of commentary that Sermon would be the guy. I didn't remember Sermon playing at all, really, last year, I guess. I didn't remember getting 35 carries, you know, and, and having a decent little yards per carry on that. Um, doesn't mean anything, really. But other than the fact that when they talk about him as the clear number two at this point in the offseason, I do think he's probably draftable in an offense that I projected to be very run heavy, an efficient running game, where Anthony Richardson's going to, you know, be a real threat to pull and run around the edge and keep defenses honest, create some rushing space for a sermon, um, potentially some rushing TDs, you know, because of the way that you can use that quarterback mobility in the red zone as a threat potentially open up some opportunities inside for some easy running back touchdowns in addition to you know Richardson's for a lot of people going to run for a lot of tees we talked about them a lot on the last show I've been toying with that projection a ton as I continue to think about it um but yeah Sermon's I think he's draftable Sean I think he's draftable so this ends up being a pretty interesting team in that we were able to get 
good ADP value at the running back position to potentially help balance out the weakness in that group, right? You get DeAndre Swift, four picks below ADP. You get Vital at a round discount. You get McLaughlin at a round and a half discount. The rest of the guys more or less where they were anticipated to go. We also got some uh, decent little values on the first couple of quarterbacks. We get McConkie as a nice little value there. It's interesting, Ben, to th- kind of think through what the other options were. I, when you get to the end of the draft and you have someone like Roshan who would have been available to us in round 17, he almost falls all the way through. And you think about taking DeAndre Swift, who frankly underperformed last year and passing Raheem Mostert into the middle of round nine. (laughs) Part of me is just thinking, you know, I would really pretty clearly prefer having Mostert there as the RB1, even though one of the reasons why we did the Swift selection was because of ADP value and the fit with JSN. I love having Chase Brown as the second running back. We could have taken Gino instead of making one of the two running back picks where we did, but both of those were the big ADP values. The interesting question would be, you know, was there someone with the Herbert pick that we felt like we really needed to make? But the next guy that we were really looking at felt basically a round and a half from there. And you contrast that with the fact that Herbert was 10 picks below ADP. I think this team has a lot of firepower, especially when you consider that it has that six wide receivers in the first seven rounds, and it has McBride in there as well. This is the type of team that is set up to win the whole thing based again on Jake Bo's simulations, on what the Road of His roster construction explorer for the uh, underdog format tells us. I guess I think that partly too, if you're drafting with the idea that you're right, I mean, if Chase Brown is the right pick, if Vital and McLaughlin are the right picks, I don't think that running back will end up being an issue, even though, I mean, Swift for me is one of those names. I mean, he, I like him. I think that below ADP, you have to take him when he's a fit. And yet as the RB1, maybe that's the spot on the roster. I'm like, yeah, a little more scoring punch there would be nice. That's fair. I, 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 yeah. I mean, I, when you say the Mostert thing, I, I, I hear you on that. The, the reality is Raheem Mostert is just a screaming value if he stays healthy at all. Right. And so in terms of this idea of you know, drafting like you're right. And if we are doing a zero RB ish build and we want an RB one who has real scoring potential from a later ADP, I mean, the guy led the NFL in, in touchdowns last year. It's not that hard to, to argue that he's that guy. Um, the Swift thing, I, I mean, I do still feel pretty good about the the I, your point about Roshan late. I, I mean, I agree with as well. Like, I think he's a very nice pick late. I've taken him and Herbert a decent amount late as well. I just think this this offense is going to have a lot more value for all of its pieces. The running backs are going to be brought along by a really dynamic passing attack. I, I mean, I. Can't remember the last time I liked a trio of receivers more than I liked th- the fit with Keenan Allen and, and DJ Moore and Roma Dunze and and Caleb Williams is this really high end quarterback prospect. I think there's going to be touchdown scoring potential, but with a rookie quarterback that they might actually lean towards just rushing it in close instead of asking him to diagnose defenses in in short field situations. I think coaches get conservative with with rookie QBs in these types of spots. I think there's going to be a, a decent amount for the the high profile. Um, free agent running back a decent amount of close rush attempts unless Roshan gets those because he's the bigger back and I think DeAndre Swift's going to get a lot more in the receiving game than he did last year with the Eagles he always did with the Lions I think we'll see that rebound uh, I think this is going to be an offense that generates some high value touches even though Caleb Williams probably will rush a decent amount as well but I think the running back scoring overall is the pie is going to be decently sized in Chicago but yeah, I mean, it's hard to make a case that Swift has more scoring punch than Raheem Mostert. I mean, that's like, I mean, again, Raheem Mostert led the NFL in touchdowns last year. It's really weird that he goes where he goes. So this was a really fun team. Again, love the six receivers in the seven rounds. You can do that 
when you have an early pick, it is more difficult when you have a later pick and you're drafting that seventh rounder on the other side of the cliff. 